Will you please be seated? Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This is the conclusion of the marathon called Proclamation from Job. It's been a rough ride, I realize. We have seen that Job has suffered the tortures of the damned. Lost everything he had, including his children, and then broke out with smallpox. We have heard about his friends suggesting that he was a great sinner. In fact, I told you last week that one of the great purposes of this book is to dispel a misunderstanding by the Jewish people that they worship of God who is one of quid pro quo. If you do this, then he'll give you this. So if the things that happened to Job happened to him, he must have been a sinner. And we cleared that up last week. And that might have answered some questions. I had you put down some questions that you had. And I was fascinated by the depth of your questions. So this morning, I am going to read the questions that I have not fully answered and try to respond to them. One of you writes this, Are trials, tragedies, planned by God to test us or drive us closer to God? Underneath that, I figure they are asking, that person is asking, whether evil is planned by God to ultimately have a good. Is God the author of evil? In the Reformed tradition, we talk about a sovereign God, and yet at the same time, a loving God. How do we come to grips with those two that sometimes seem polar opposites. How do we reconcile the two concepts? Many a scripture says, no, God is not the author of evil. In James, the first chapter, God does not tempt anyone. How are we going to grapple with that real presence of evil in this world of ours. First, I would have you consider space. Outer space. Now, space is a hard concept for us to grasp. When we think of space, we think of stars and moon and earths and uh, planets revolving around their suns. But space is actually nothing. It's hard for the human mind that is conditioned by something to think of space as being nothing. Before the beginning, before the word came forth and all that is was created, there was nothing but space. But when God said, let there be light, and there was and it was good, the opposite of light became apparent. Darkness. As a matter of fact, when God proclaims it to be good, by something being good, and existing is good, the opposite, the dark side of bad and evil exist. When we talk of God's love, 
Then we must, on the other hand, the dark side of love is hatred. It's hate. So God, by creating light, love, and saying it was good, is in a sense a de facto cause of the suffering. In essence, by something coming into existence, there is the possibility of non-existence. Now, that may not handle it for you, because there's a lot more to it. God is not the author of evil per se, but that which God does is good, thus the dark side of good is bad. One asks, when someone is suffering and we pray for them, what are we praying to happen? What is God's will? Good question. I take this to mean that ultimately God allows, by God's power, evil to continue. The fact that all things are not rolled up in the eschaton, the last part of life, there's a purpose for us to exist. Now, if we pray for something other than the will of God, are we going against God in the fact? I would bring to your remembrance, and I've spoken of this before, that there it has been put forth that there are three wills of God. The intentional will of God. That's what we see in creation. And yet evil arises and thus we come to the circumstantial will of God. Circumstantial will of God, when evil comes, God has the power to use that which is evil for the good. It has been said by the Apostle Paul, all things work for good to them that love God. And then there is the ultimate will of God. And what that means is the cross never has the last word. It is the empty tomb that has the last word. So I say to you, when you pray, pray honestly. Pray really what's on your mind. You might as well, because if you don't, God knows you're not really being honest. If you want someone to be healed, pray for them. That's what you want. Be honest before God. Job's story ultimately is about that feeling that one has when tragedy strikes, that feeling of utter helplessness. And yet, Job did not curse God. Now, what this means is, Job did not deny God's existence and involvement with human beings. We pray... We pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the strength of the Spirit to endure the trials as a child of God. We pray for the faith to receive the abiding presence that is promised to all of God's children. Comfort us, we cry. In our time of trial and tribulation, comfort us. Let us feel your presence in our lives. That is an honest prayer. And then someone writes, 
My mother said Job's story is an example of character building. Can we still, that person writes, have a great faith and not have to go through this character building through suffering? Do you want me to answer that? No. <laughs> you are correct, but I'm going to anyway. You can have faith and it be a great faith. But sooner or later, by the natural order of things, trial and tribulation will come. It is said by many, it is in the time of crisis that what we really believe comes to bear and comes to the forefront. And if we are going to be able to be the new creation that God from the foundation of the world has wanted us to be, and then we must accept. Time of suffering is also a time of strengthening. How in the world are we going to identify with the horrors and the senselessness of pain if we have not experienced some ourselves. We will understand them once removed. But that is not the same thing as being drawn into the suffering of another human being because we identify in them that which we ourselves have experienced. I had a professor in seminary my first time around. Some of you don't know me. You mean you had to go twice because you didn't get it the first time? The answer is yes, most likely. Professor of homiletics. That's preaching. Now I had a work study that I was supposed to go and clean the chapel. And I don't know how it got mixed up, my schedule. What, I can't or not remember the specifics, but I have not cleaned the chapel for the worship that day and the homiletics class right afterwards. And when the professor looked around and saw dirt on the floor, nothing had been dusted, the bulletins had not been picked up, he went off on me. I mean, he blew me right out the front door, verbally. In front of all my colleagues, I was being dismantled piece by piece. Now my normal reaction to that, such force should be confronted by a greater force. But as I looked at him, I saw a man in pain. His wife had one month to live. It was the Holy Spirit, I think, that made me just take it. And afterwards, we became lifelong friends. He suggested I should put my name to be president of Austin Seminary. I told him I wasn't politician enough. You can tell by my preaching. This lesson I learned, I have used faithfully. 
Never preach a sermon that cannot be applicable to a, a person dying of cancer. Because if it is not true to them, it is not true at all. And therein is the difference of the Reformed faith. We hold up a theology of suffering instead of a theology of glory, a this for that, a quid pro quo, and if something bad happens, you did something wrong, we say no. Nothing is beyond the power of God to resurrect. We might as well learn the le lessons when suffering comes because we have paid such a heavy price. Now I want to tell you, do not run around looking for suffering so you can learn the lessons. You don't have to do that. And if you are doing that, please see me after the service. I need to refer you to somebody. <laughs> suffering is in your future. One pastor put it, we're all on the, uh, we are all on the Titanic. But somebody says, what about long-term stress and crisis? After we've learned the lessons of love and compassion, we have been able to wring out every lesson from this pain. What about that pain and suffering that continues on? I can only say this. There is always that one last lesson. When we know our demise or our death is imminent, the lesson for us then is surrender in hope. That was the lesson Christ showed us on the cross. His feelings of being forsaken by God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then the next question, the next statement is, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The surrender, faith, and hope. I've yet to experience that. If you're in here this morning, you have not experienced that. And that is the final lesson of our lives. To each of us is appointed a time to die. But by the power of God's Spirit, May we be able, when the time comes, and all else fails, to seek the peace of God that passes understanding, and the strength of God that embraces the hope that lays before us. This does not answer all of your questions. In fact, it may raise more than I've answered. And they are not the only attempts to answer. But as I struggle with the book of Job, these things I have shared with you in the past three weeks are also things that I have thought about for the 28 years of being here with you.
And I pray for you. This prayer. That your suffering. Never be for nothing. Learn. Learn and love. And when your time comes, I pray that you have the strength of Job. Do not not deny God, but surrender in hope and thereby claim the crown of peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.